All right, good, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank, you for, thank you for coming in, inside here with all of the wonderful distractions outside. I'm not sure I would do it if there was a Marachi band outside. And um, so I've been introduced already, uh, those of you who come in late, but I wanna just say a thank you to um, the technicians who we don't really see, right? They come out and set this up and they help uh, me do the um, arrangement of slides. We have 15 slides and then they work out a DVD for your uh, benefit or for classes. So uh, I just wanna say thank you up there for uh, your technical assistance. Okay, so um, the title of my talk is Oranges and Lemons Say the Bells of St. Clemens. Uh, you know that from a song in this book. And now that I think of this book, uh, I wonder if we could imagine for a moment what it is that you're actually picking up when you uh, pick up 1984. Uh, you probably know from your instructors and your friends that this is one of the most important books uh, written in the English language in the last century. And it's so important, actually, <coughs> that some of its words have flowed right into the contemporary vocabulary that we use every day. Um, words like big brother and newspeak and doublethink and some of its phrases have just flowed right into the English language. For example, war is peace, right? Or big brother is watching you. Or uh, this saying that um, it's important in, in this talk that I'm gonna give, um, this party slogan, who controls the past controls the future, who controls the present controls the past. And the author's name, George Orwell, has jumped right off the title page into um, common use in the English language by political commentators. So if you see the word Orwellian, uh, you know that it means a darkly apocalyptic, suggesting or implying a bleak future for the human race. So important things have flowed into the English language out of this book. And there's, a, there's something else that's flowed into uh, consciousness out of this book too, which is that Orwell has actually empowered us has given us the words and the concepts to um, push back and to ward off uh, that negative, uh, dark, apocalyptic future by his book. And uh, um, this will become clearer in the course of this talk. So George Orwell, I am very grateful for your book. Now, in 1984, George Orwell uh, shows that there's several pathways to a future totalitarian state totalitarian state, in other words, in which the government has assumed a total religious, economic, social control. But we're gonna focus on one significant pathway, Big Brother's destruction of the community, which supports, sustains, and in a sense, constructs the individual. So you have to think of a, a city or a community that actually constructs, to some degree, you, right? Your likes, your dislikes, your choices, and so forth. And um, by following this pathway, the pathway of um, uh, the George Orwell on the community, we can lead, uh, go deeper into this book. And in the concrete terms of this book, that means the desolation of London, England, where the book is set, and almost all of the action in the book takes place in London. Um, and the main protagonist, whose name is Winston Smith, uh, born and I believe raised in London also. Now, in the very uh, first part of this book, Winston Smith realizes that London has been ruined. London has been destroyed and lost all around him and, and also around every citizen. So the, that's the first thing he has to find out. What has caused London to be destroyed and lost? And um, searching to find his own self, he finds that he has to find London too. You know, what part of him, um, uh, what part of him belongs to London. And struggling to find lost London, he comes to realize he is struggling against the party on the side of something wider that belongs to humanity itself, the community, the community of the city that helps to construct each of us. And so in uh, struggling to recover London, he finds himself struggling to find himself and to find a healthy future for the English people and to, to some extent uh, to find uh, something in the potential of England itself. Now, it might seem strange um, 
if I stand up here and I say, well, <clears throat> a city could have a meaning, you know, a, a, a purpose, like a mission, something special that that city contributes to the whole planet. And, um, and it might also seem a bit of a stretch to say that the individual inhabitant, like Winston of, of London, uh, is to some extent constructed by that city. But allow us to follow out the plot, and you'll see what Orwell uh, means by this, and, and also what Orwell thinks is special about England, which I will call um, uh, uh, London, sorry, which I will call England's storied capital. Um, why does the destruction of the great and storied city of London answer the purposes of Big Brother? How does the destruction of London as a living community result in the desolation of its inhabitants? So Winston, very early in the book actually, says, I'm cut off and everyone else is cut off on every side from any, from any real reaction with my fellow citizens. And thus they all become easy prey to the party. So that leads us right into the title song, Oranges and Lemons. <clears throat> For over the first section of the book, Winston is finding little snippets of a song, um, uh, probably taught to school children in London even to this day. It's called Oranges and Lemons Say the Bells of St. Clemens. And when he eventually recovers the full song, which is actually on page 99 in this book here, Winston finds it strangely illuminating as if London is alive in this song. And so here's the song. Oranges and lemons Say the bells of St. Clemens You owe me five farthings Say the bells of St. Martin's When will you pay me Say the bells of Old Bailey When I grow rich Say the bells of Shoreditch When will that be Say the bells of Stepney I do not know Says the great bell more, but we'll leave, the, we'll leave your head chopped off for a minute <laughs> and, and go back for a second here. <clears throat> so. Okay, now, so that's the text of this song, and uh, George Orwell uh, writes something very interesting about this. <clears throat> he says, as follows, um, <clears throat> Well, he, he actually, um, um, he says a great deal about this, and um, I, I think uh, I, I want to just say a little bit, um, because you might not actually realize that this song is about London. It's about the old London that actually was a warm uh, matrix for its inhabitants. So, first of all, uh, the bells of London are uh, prominent, and every church in London would have bells. This is only one of many bells, but that's an example. And you see, that's um, about um, four or five feet high. It's almost as high as a person. And uh, these were very expensive bells. And <coughs> I believe that uh, the bells are individually cast so that they would have different tones. So a bell in one church would sound different from a bell in another church. They were not, uh, they were not made uh, in mass production, right? And then another thing about this, um, uh, game, or oranges and lemons, is that it was also a singing game. Uh, now, I don't, see the, I don't see the children singing, but they should be singing. <laughs> oranges and lemons say the bells of St. Clemens, and when you get to the end, your arms come down, and here comes a chopper to chop off your head, and the one that's caught is, gets its head chopped off. Maybe, maybe her, or maybe him. Whatever, right? <laughs> okay. <coughs> and uh, it's quite a... Um, quite an interesting little drama there, actually. So try to hear the song and try to see it as a, a game. Okay. Now, this is what Winston says about it. <clears throat> All the while that they were talking, the half-remembered rhyme kept running through Winston's head, right? 
half remembered it because Big Brother wanted to wipe out the past of London, right? And this is part of the past, the bells and games and so forth. Oranges and lemons say the bells of St. Clemens, you owe me three farthings, say the bells of St. Martin's. By the way, you may have noticed that in the song, it's five farthings. I don't understand exactly the reason why um, there's been this inflation in farthings, but <laughs> it happens, there's a little discrepancy. It was curious, but when you said it to yourself, you had the illusion of actually hearing bells, the bells of a lost London that still existed somewhere or other disguised and forgotten. I think that's interesting, and I'll return to that later. You, know, you had the illusion of actually hearing bells, the bells of a lost London that still existed somewhere or other disguised and forgotten. From one ghostly steeple to after another, he seemed to hear them peeling forth, yet so far as he could remember, he had never in real life heard church bells ringing because the party had appropriated all the churches and either tore them down or turned them into war museums or uh, storehouses or something, okay? All right. <coughs> so uh, please observe here uh, that he hears an illusion. So he had it like maybe illusion's not quite the best word. It was actually sort of a vision, like a, a musical vision of hearing bells. And uh, <coughs> it's a beautiful, this is a beautiful experience for him. Well, actually, one of the most beautiful experiences he had to date in the book, which is, you know, if you've read much of it, it's pretty bleak, right? So he uh, has a experience of something beautiful, and at the same time, he remembers the price uh, that London has to pay for this, the price in suffering, um, because he, he looks out at London, Winston looks out, and he sees a grimy landscape. And um, he has a vague distaste for everything in his landscape. And off he sees the vistas of rotting houses where the houses are falling down that people are living in. Um, the windows are patched with cardboard. The garden walls are sagging. There's bomb sites all over as uh, London is being slowly blown to bits by rocket bombs. So the whole city is d disintegrating and being um, taken apart, right? And, and uh, Big Brother and the party are doing nothing to uh, preserve London whatsoever. In fact, um, uh, the citizens are cowering all the time from these uh, bombs that are falling, and they build themselves uh, sordid colonies of wooden dwellings like chicken houses. So people are living in chicken houses. And uh, <laughs> a good assignment would be to list the adjectives that um, Winston uses to describe London. You know. Uh, cold, hungry, greedy, dusty, sterile, vile, sordid, ruinous, you know, and lost. Bells of a lost London. So everything good about it has been lost. Now, it's a little difficult to see what exactly has been lost. It requires us to do a little historical digging. Uh, so first of all, he says they're ghostly steeples. Well, let's see what the steeples were actually like in London. Okay, so here's a picture of London. And do you know what the bridge is crossing the Thames River there? That's London Bridge, right? And uh, you'll see uh, quite, it, this is the, this is the, I said, about 1550. And it's interesting to see these ships here because you see those are rigged sailing ships, which means that um, trade from around the world is coming up the Thames into London. And on the other side of London Bridge is much smaller craft um, because the river is shallower here. And the, the Thames, by the way, is tidal, so the ships come up the river on the incoming tide and go out to sea on the outgoing tide. Okay, now, what do you notice about London in 1550? I notice church steeples everywhere, right? Uh, this, is, this is the prominent feature. Uh, whoa, way out in the country prominent feature of the town is church steeples and, and every church uh, steeple houses one or more bells and the bells ring the hours you see they um, they ring like one o'clock or something and and I don't know whether you can see this but if you think back to 1550 this is a very prosperous growing city this is London right at the beginning of the Elizabethan age 
when London was making an uh, international impression. Okay? I mean, almost a city of churches. And um, you'll find that um, um, the, the, the scene looks like it's. Oh, with music in the streets. No. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> this is a, um, kind of a bustling and vigorous modern city, okay? <clears throat> and um, now, how, do, how, how would. And drums in the street. That's great background. So, how would uh, oranges and lemons come to be identified with St. Clemens? Well, um, ships coming up the Thames would dock at a certain place, and let's say uh, part of your cargo was citrus from, say, some Mediterranean land, perhaps uh, Italy or uh, Spain, and they would be unloaded. So, St. Clemens would be identified with oranges and lemons being brought in, and same with everything else in the song. Okay, so. So London, you see, is a river city, and the Thames is the vital artery that goes right through the middle of it. And here's a uh, little a picture of uh, what this might look like. So this is a, a um, oops. This is a picture of um, the. Um, this is a picture of London from the Thames River. So here's the Thames here, and. Uh, you're being brought in closer. You see, steeples everywhere. Right? Steeples, um, and uh, from each steeple would be, would be a characteristic bell. Okay. So back to this, and let's uh, think a little bit here. <coughs> now, uh, is the London that's lost, uh, just this Renaissance or Elizabethan London, or does London go back even further? And uh, you probably realize that London was the Roman capital, uh, Londinium, of the Roman province of Britain. So now you're going back almost 2,000 years. And London Bridge actually was a bridge originally built by the Romans. And uh, they, they, underneath London here, are still many Roman temples and forums and things like that, uh, palaces. And then, uh, you know, London, um, London goes on. We have the Anglo-Saxon times and the Middle Ages and Elizabethan London, 18th and 19th century, the war-torn 20th century, where rocket bombs really did fall on London. You remember the V1 and V2 rockets that Hitler launched? Uh, I think uh, um, several thousand of them actually fell on London, blowing parts of it to bits. Okay. And so uh, war and oppression in uh, 1984 have, in the book, silenced the bells. And in fact, they've silenced the churches. And they've silenced everything else. Um, here, here is um, Orwell talking about a church. He said, St. Martin's, you know, we, uh, you owe me five farthing, say the bells of St. Martin's, was a museum used for pro propaganda displays, scale models of rocket bombs and flying fortresses, floating fortresses. Waxwork tableau illustrating em enemy atrocities and the like. So you see, instead of um, a religious ceremony, you had uh, models of battleships and rocket bombs. Now, um, so what, what actually uh, might have transpired in something like Westminster Abbey, which is the big cathedral uh, going back to the Middle Ages. And uh, if you know Westminster Abbey, that's uh, where the, I believe the queen is, or the king or queen is, uh, uh, crowned and uh, many solemn political gatherings take place there and tourists go to Westminster Abbey and if you're a tourist and you love English uh, where do you go in Westminster Abbey you go to Poets Corner right where you see the memorial to Shakespeare and the bot and the entombment of Milton and Johnson and um, Wordsworth and all the other great writers of the English language imagine all uh, so the, the, the church is not just a memorial to religion, but a, memor a memorial to the language, the literature, and the culture of the whole city. Okay, and then you start to say, well, London. What, what was London, or what is London? And it's a tremendous hub of commerce. It's a trading capital. It's a place for uh, scientific and technical advancement. 
uh, which led the world. And you can think of the Royal Society in that regard. And museums and universities, uh, theaters, uh, music and symphonies of all kinds, the principal seat of the uh, English court system, the legal system, the residence of the royal family, and the seat of government. Wow, imagine if we had one city in the United States that did all those things, right? Um, and um, so the community that was London nurtured and ennobled the people that were Londoners, and, um, and especially the English Parliament, you know, it represents um, an increasing understanding of the rights and freedom of the individual. So there's a certain irony. You, you destroy uh, the soul of the city and you uh, lose the sense that England, had, uh, England has had a great deal to do with individual freedom and individual rights uh, as a historical uh, phenomenon among other countries in the world. So a Londoner, without the living pulse of London uh, throbbing in, in his or her veins, would hardly be, hardly be a citizen at all. Now, in, the, in, in 1984, this whole story, the whole city is lost, right? But you, if you remember, he said, it still existed somewhere. Somewhere or other, London still existed. And I've been thinking about this a lot. Where, where, where does Winston think London still exists if, uh, if all its monuments have been uh, destroyed? <coughs> I mean, th think how thoroughly they were destroyed. You know, statues, inscriptions, memorial stones, the names of streets, anything that might throw light on the past has been systematically altered. Everything that would remind Winston of the past of London has been altered, changed, uh, forged, actually. Um, in fact, there's a certain irony in that Winston himself works in the Ministry of Truth, and his product is fake news. So um, if you think about fake news, it has a um, place in here, too. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, uh, systematically speaking, this is how the party regarded its work creating fake news. So uh, towards the end, uh, O'Brien, who is a representative of the party and a big brother, says, there is a party slogan dealing with the control of the past, he said. Repeat it, if you please. And who controls the past controls the future. Who controls the present controls the past, repeated Winston obediently. Who controls the present controls the past, said O'Brien, nodding his head with slow approval. Is it your opinion, Winston, that the past has real existence? <laughs> That's asked con contemptuously. Is it your opinion that the past is real? How can you possibly believe in your opinion that the past ever had any real existence? You are badly deluded <laughs> if you think so, right? Did the church bells and oranges and lemons ever exist? The party says no. Whatever the party holds to be truth is truth. Two plus two equals, remember this from the book? Two plus two equals five. <laughs> and and O'Brien must, uh, um, um, O'Brien compels Winston to say, yes, two plus two is five, because the party says it's truth. And, um, and this is a crucial, um, point in the book. Untruth rules in 1984, and it rules everyone. So untruth uh, affects everyone's rights, their habits, it terrorizes them. Untruth ultimately reinforces the power and the rule of Big Brother, and untruth is the key to power. Okay. So back to uh, considering London. Now, is, the, does, does the past have real existence? I mean, um, existence is a huge word in 1984. What exists and what doesn't exist? And I would have to say, because I'm standing here at the lectern and I'm listening to drums, I have to pat it and I say, does this lectern have real existence? Does the floor have real existence? Thank you. Uh, does the, <laughs> Is this a product of the past? Is this a product of the past? How real is it, right? And you say, of course the past has real existence. Of course, and I'm quoting from Edouard Chiray, a famous uh, French philosopher, 
for the past contains and prepares the future as the future issues from the past and completes it. That's a great little saying, right? Put that against O'Brien and the party, right? The past contains and prepares the future as the future issues from the past and completes it. And even, um, here's a little quote from Cicero. Not to know what happened before you were born is perpetually to remain a child. I was kind of scared when I first read that, I thought. How much do I really know, you know, and how much am I prepared to have an adult understanding of the world? So um, Winston and his lover Julia must struggle towards adulthood, you know, not being a child, in a world that wraps their citizens in childlike ignorance because it's cut them off from the past. You know, ignorance is strength. That's what um, Winston has to almost memorize, right? Uh, ignorance keeps, ch uh, keeps citizens childlike and keeps the party all powerful. And frankly, uh, I think Winston is a, a tr is a bit of a hero in the book because he refuses to remain ignorant. And by the novel's end, he uh, presses towards a full consciousness of what the party's doing for him, doing with him, right? Now, um, now I think it's a little clearer what meaning a city most might possess. I said that was a bit of a stretch, but try it on. What's the meaning of London? Well, I'd say the meaning of London is that it's the crucial cocoon and the web of language and culture allowing uh, its citizens to grow out of childlike ignorance to fuller and fuller awareness. You know, that's the reason the party takes every effort to debase and erase the past. The city is the matrix. I want to rescue that word from maybe a movie that's debased it. <laughs> London is a sort of matrix for its citizens, right? Destroy the matrix, destroy the person. And how to destroy the matrix? By destroying its past, that is, its, its reality, see? And centuries of language, the language, art, architecture, science, music, cultural rituals like marriage and death. They have woven a matrix around everyone and the matrix is destroyed. Okay. Now, Winston has said that uh, somehow or other London still exists and he realizes gradually that there's something London-like, he calls it ghost, the, in the ghostly steeples. Um, maybe it's not possible to erase the past. That's a little question the book leaves with you. Maybe the past is ineffaceable. Maybe you can't, a human beings cannot really erase the past. Maybe that's a delusion of the party, uh, that uh, the party enforces. So now let's uh, hear, let's hear uh, this one more time here. Oranges and lemons Say the bells of St. Clemens You owe me five farthings Say the bells of St. Martin's When will you pay me? Say the bells of Old Bailey When I grow rich Say the bells of Shoreditch When will that be? Say the bells of Stepney I do not know Says the great bell Say the bells of St. Peter's Two sticks and an apple Say the bells of Whitechapel Old Father Bald Pit Say the slow bells of Old Gate Pokers and tongs Say the bells of St. John's Kettles and pans Say the bells of St. Anne's Brick bats and tiles Say the bells of St. Giles Well, we had to hear the last part of the song. 
right? <laughs> and uh, so that chil the children's game comes back in right at the end there. So, so now we have to think a little bit about the wisdom of children. So I, I've been kind of saying how, um, uh, looking at London's more positive matrix side, but uh, you know, what about this chopping off your head business? Why, why is the song so bloody? Although the children, of course, don't really think of it as bloody. They probably think of it as a great game. And what a great ending, you know, chop off your head, right? Comes right down. But actually, that's a chopping off people's heads is part of the history of London, too. There were, just look at the history of London. Constant executions and beheadings. If you were in the nobility, they'd behead you. If you were uh, of the uh, poorer classes, they'd just hang you. Uh, every week, or often uh, more than once a week, huge crowds would uh, uh, press around the places of execution. It was like the big show of the day or of the week, beheading. Sorry <laughs> to say these things. And um, um, so planted down in London is a little core of um, darkness. So down in the matrix is a little bit of cruelty and exploitation and lust for power. And uh, the shadow side, which Orwell knew well. And so the men like O'Brien are cruel and brutal, and they're Londoners. And organizations like the party are also Londoners, right? Yeah, in fact, even the rats, which, by the way, rats, if, you, if you've read to the end, you know the importance of the London rats, right? And uh, the worst rat of all is called a grandfather of the sewers of London, out from the, there's something wants to come right up from the sewers. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so here's where uh, 1984 becomes, uh, says something very modern, and we need to take this uh, personally. In other words, um, there's, a, there's light and there's darkness lurking in every city, and in every city uh, we're formed uh, both positively and negatively. And um, so I'm going to make a little, another little stretch, and I'd say um, 2018 is 1984, potentially. In fact, uh, every year is potentially a 1984. Um, here's some, some evidence of this. This is uh, from last week, uh, Press Democrat. Uh, this is the Zuckerberg hearing. You know, I think he's trying, but I think if we don't get our arms around this, meaning you know, arms around internet problems, none of us is going to have any privacy anymore. Um, Wow, could be, huh? To what extent is 2018, uh, 1984? Here's another one. Um, Ai Weiwei is a quite a well-known modern Chinese dissident and artist. If you see what happens in China, you know, you've, you've probably heard about the Great Firewall and the censorship in China and so forth. The party, as China is ruled by one party, constantly changes reality and history to its own favor, which really establishes a totally tyrannical control, which is <laughs> basically the thesis of my presentation. If you want a totally tyrannical control, change reality and history in your favor, right? So these are sobering, and uh, we have to be thankful uh, to Orwell for his unveiling of this. And just I'd like to make a couple little concluding remarks here. So we can allow um, the, the song, however, uh, Oranges and Lemons. Let's see if I can get that back. We can allow the song to, um, th the song to say something in itself. So let, let's let the song make the final commentary uh, on London and its past. Uh, I'd say the song is realistic. It says something about the light and the dark sides of London, but it's also a children's game, and it's full of fantasy, and it's uh, lovely, it's whimsical, it's beautiful, it's a game. And I think that says something powerful about uh, the child's mind, about the resilience of children, about happiness and delight that come into the world with children. These are important things. And to this day, as I said, British children sing the song and learn it. So I'd like to close um, the book if I could, on brutality and cruelty and the sewers. <laughs> I close the book on that and maybe at the end of the lecture and just say, 
hearing the song, we can take away a uh, happy, playful, uh, delightful feeling for London. And the bells are ringing, the citizens are, uh, are um, going to church or perhaps um, contemplating maybe their better nature. And at the end of the song, the children sing, here comes a candle to light you to bed. They could take that to mean they're about to go to bed. They can hum and sing the song, perhaps their parents sing it, and they go peacefully to sleep in their little warm beds, and they might even hear in the distance the ringing of some bells, and the child might think as he's going to sleep, is that St. Martin's? Is that St. Martin's? Is that St. Clement's? I'm done. <laughs> Um, I think there's food outside. Who am I to ask for questions? But if, if for, let's say five minutes, if anyone has any. Anybody want to hear? No, no more songs. No. <laughs> any any um, questions of any kind? You want to question reality? <laughs> okay. Well. Oh. Yeah, sure. Thank you. That's a great question. Uh, oh, yes, she asked them, uh, do you know anything about the history of the song itself? Like, when did it arise and so forth? Um, actually, uh, folklorists haven't been able to, dis to discern that. They said it seemed to be always a children's game um, by, by looking in the past. I, I did look into that a little bit. The one thing I did find is that when they say, um, here comes a candle to light you to bed, that actually meant that when a person was about to be beheaded, uh, the night before they were to be beheaded, they got a candle placed outside their cell. Uh, that was, a, the, the government would give you that much consolation. You get a candle to light you to bed, and then in the morning, we'll chop off your head. That even rhymes. Candle to light you to bed, in the morning, we'll chop off your head. Um, let's look it up, though. That would be fun to look up. Okay. Well, go think about it. It's a great book. All right. <laughs> and, and to our technicians. <laughs> okay. Great. Thank you, David. That was fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was fun. I was wondering if. Oops, let me turn this on.